All right. Welcome to our second plenary session. This one's called the Challenge of Digital Abundance. Uh, Public Sector Partners did our first uh, data conference about 10 years ago. Uh, how many of you remember Terry Takai? Yeah, that's how I, I'm old. Uh, Terry approached us and said, you know, we found out that uh, the state has got these huge data libraries of the Department of Resources all around this, this uh, GIS stuff. And I don't know what GIS is, so can you do a conference to tell everybody how to utilize that? So we stood up a conference called GIS More Than a Map. And that was kind of the start of the road of the discussion about how to leverage the oceans of data that government has. Here today to uh, continue that discussion is Ernst & Young. Uh, we're going to join, we're going to be joined by their uh, global government and public sector leader George Atala for a provocative keynote and panel discussion on the risks and opportunities for government as a result of the digital revolution. Please give a warm round of applause, George Atala. All right, good morning everyone. So we're going to be, uh, so my name first is George Atala. I'm EY's global leader for government and public sector. We're going, so the, the presentation is titled Digital Abundance and I am sure some of you are wondering, what does that mean? What is digital abundance? Well, we, we use the term digital abundance because now with all the technologies that are out there, there is actually more for us to do and more for us to leverage and to use than ever before. And that actually within itself creates a number of new opportunities. So I'm going to go through a very short presentation, then I will ask my panelists to come up on stage and we'll try to have an interesting discussion highlighting some of the challenges that we, that governments are facing pretty much everywhere. As I mentioned, I am, I am EY's global leader for government and, and public sector, so I've had this privilege of working in, in many countries and of having a, a line of oversight over about 85 countries where, where EY uh, currently works. So let's get started. Before I do, I have to also mention that I'm based in Washington and I just checked, it's 20 degrees warmer. <laughs> so what's happening, folks? I mean, this is California, come on. So let's get started. If we could go to the next slide. So. It's, 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 some of you might be familiar with the fact that Amazon is looking for a second headquarters. And one of the interesting things about the questions that Amazon is asking um, is, how is your public school system? How are your STEM programs? How good is the airport? Um, how bad is the congestion? Uh, how easy to find office space? How about warehousing space? Where will the workers come from? These are typical competitive questions that every government now has to struggle with. So it's not just enough to manage government services. It's also about how do you make your location more desirable for businesses to move into. Also, having mentioned Amazon, there's always this expectation that government services should be a little bit, and I'm not you know, giving a plug here for Amazon by, by no means, uh, but there's this expectation that government services should be a little bit like Amazon Prime, where you, know, you buy on your mobile and you get delivery the next day. And I think we're far from that point yet. Uh, however, there is nothing to say that technology cannot get us there at some point. These are some of the typical problems and I mean there are a few more as well. Maintaining public trust for instance, you know, making sure that, that uh, uh, the, the finances that government is overseeing are also being well spent. But how do you address this? And you know, in a lot, if we could go to the second slide please. A lot of the meetings that we have uh, around the world, these are the typical issues that come up. And, and you see them here on this slide. I will not you know, cover them in detail. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them already. Um, and, and they include things like, you know, we're being asked to do more with less. In general, you know, you do less with less, right? So that's, that's the outcome. Or 
you know, it's wonderful if we could collaborate more within, you know, whether it's a municipal or a city or a state government, but however, we have these organizational silos that prevent us from doing so. Uh, we don't have the right IT infrastructure. Our systems don't talk to each other. So when we talk about, you know, how can we use data analytics, we don't even have the same set of data and we can't even access the same data, right? So these are typical que uh, problems that we hear pretty much everywhere. A bigger problem is where will the people working in government come from? So if you think about, and we did a survey with, with LinkedIn a while ago, if you look at the people who are, that government is really eager to, to get on board, whether it's in cyber, whether it's in data analytics, robotics, I mean, those are you know, really hot areas right now. How will you find the right people to work in government and, and be able to do this? So again, coming back to the title of this presentation, it is digital abundance. There's a lot out there, but then how do we take advantage? And by when, you know, the word, when I, when I mention we, I am, of course, referring to, to state government. So what are some of those technologies, if we could go to the next slide? So you see AI, and there have been a lot of concerns about AI. You know, the statistics show that it can, in fact, reduce costs, and it can improve services, but then how do you really use it, and how, how, how to avoid getting in trouble when you do use it? Uh, blockchain is something that we hear a lot about, and again, how is it applicable? So, I mean, we understand that it improves trust, it ensures data integrity, but then how do you actually use it when you manage government services? Cyber, again, huge issue. I'm sure you've been uh, hearing and, and seeing the news. Uh, not only government is subject to cyber attacks, but also the private sector. You could even argue that government has a role, not just to protect itself, but also to protect you know, the, the companies that, that work within its jurisdiction. It's a huge issue everywhere. Data analytics, and we've been at EY doing a lot of work using data analytics for all sorts of wonderful things, you know, improving graduation rates at public schools, uh, addressing the uh, opioids epidemic. I mean, there are a number of ways you could use this, but then again, you know, how do you actually do this? Do you have the right people? So let me stop here and invite my panelists to come to the, to, to the stage, Andrea and Keith, and I will introduce them and we will get this uh, conversation going. All right, so let me first introduce my panelists. First, we have Andrea Roman. Andrea is the Clerk Executive Officer of the Court of Appeal, 3rd Appellate uh, District. Uh, she is the court's principal executive officer with oversight responsibility for the clerk's office, budgeting, procurement, security, human resources, and business services. Uh, before joining the appellate court, she served as chief deputy director of policy for the Department of Technology. So, Andrea, thank you for, for being here. Thank you. And then Keith, who actually is just far better than I am, and I should actually take note that I'm perhaps overdressed for a technology <laughs> conference. Um, Keith Steyer is EY's uh, global uh, leader for artificial intelligence. He is also the global technology digital leader. He is responsible for EY's global AI practice offerings, market messaging, partnerships, capability and leadership development. He's also the principal author of EY's Principles for AI System Design, a conversational AI design playbook, and EY's Intelligent uh, Automation Narrative. So Keith, thank you also sure. for joining. My pleasure. So let's get started? Yes. All right, excellent. So. Andrea, let me, let me start with you. When, when it comes, and this is something that we've seen all over the world, um, government is not typically known for being a first mover. Um, that, but yet, we talk a lot about innovation and, and you know, how can you uh, make things different and you know, not just repeat the old way of doing things. How can you get innovation to work in, uh, in government? Is it, is it something that can be done? Absolutely, I think it can be. So, so first, to probably defend government, I would say that um, you know, government doesn't spend its own money, right? A unlike the private sector where they're spending their money, the money they, they make, government spends your money. Um, and because of that, the government has typically been very risk adverse, right? They're, they're paranoid almost to the extent of, you know, um, you know, if we can't be guaranteed a positive outcome, we can't even put our foot in the water. 
Um, and I think that in order for government to be able to play in the game and to become innovative and do some of the things that you've seen some of the, the presenters talk about earlier today, um, it comes down to leadership. And if you listen to any of the presentations from earlier, uh, it really was about leadership, right? Um, and I think it takes leadership who's willing to invest in their people, um, to recognize that there's ways to do technology that doesn't require you to invest the bank. You can start small, you can grow big, uh, you can build your projects around outcomes so that you have the opportunity to assess um, as necessary to redo, to replan. Um, and those are things that I don't think we've done very well historically. I think we've spent a lot of time trying to solve all of the problems of a department in one fell swoop. Instead of saying, where do we need to start? Let's get some value add first. Let's prove that we can do it, whether that's through a pilot, whether it's through modular implementations or component implementations, um, and, and then let's grow from there. Excellent. Um, and you know, while we're on the subject of, of innovation, Keith, uh, just turning to you, and I, you know, I mean, AI has caused, uh, is causing actually a lot of uh, uh, alarm, right? I mean, if, if you've heard uh, Stephen Hawking's, he warned against it, and Elon Musk also spoke about it. And I mean, sometimes I wonder if, if the movie Terminator will become a documentary one of, one of those days instead of a science fiction movie. But am I off? I, I must be off, right? I mean, you've been around the world, you've seen a lot of interesting innovation happening. What, what, what have you seen that kind of you know, stuck yeah. to you? Yeah. I mean, there are a few topics that ignite the imagination, like the possibility of automating human intelligence, right, or human-like intelligence. Uh, you know, it's interesting, if you go back 10 or 15 years and you do a Google word search and, and you look at, you type in AI, and, and you can just, you know, you can do this online, uh, and you see these little spikes, you know, over the last 10 years, they all correlate with the Terminator movies. I mean, they, they just do. Uh, you, you know, whenever there's a big movie on this topic, people go and search for it. But since 2015, it just, the, the search uh, around these topics just went like that, hockey stick. Uh, it's no longer associated with movies. It's become a bit more of a, of a mainstream, non-cinematic topic, uh, you know, as, as AI has moved out of uh, the sort of fantasy land and, frankly, academia into more of a commercially viable uh, solution for different things. But, but uh, there is still this, there is still this cloud. I think AI has a PR problem, uh, frankly. Uh, and and, and listen, I don't agree or disagree with, with whether it was Stephen Hawking's, you know, the eminent professor, or Elon, or, or, or Bill Gates has made statements. A, number, a lot of very prominent scientists and business executives have expressed concern. But, but the reality is there's no immediate fear or issue on AI becoming superhuman intelligent to the point where it becomes sentient and, and so it takes over the world. Robot Armageddon is not our immediate concern. It just is not, right? I'm not saying it's not a potential concern for our grandchildren, but, but really the immediate issue is what do we do with it? Uh, you know, the, AI is just math, right? It's just math. If you peel the onion or look behind the curtain, it's just math. And humans write that math, and humans architect that math and curate. And, and so it's really like any other tool or technology, it only becomes weaponized by people. And so it's really the, the, the bigger, more near-term concerns are sort of uh, the, the agreement or lack thereof on the, the beneficial use of AI, you know, a, a, again, like any other tool or technology, and, and to what end do you want to apply those technologies to advance, you know, humanity? And to the extent that they're applied to non-beneficial uses, there's, there are genuine concerns about, you know, lethal autonomous weaponry and other, you know, and, and, and other kind of and, and AI-enabled cyber threats that, that, you know, can create turmoil, but, but Again, there's, there's a positive and a negative side to all of these you know, innovations, and I think it is upon us. I think the good news is, frankly, compared to some other technologies, which I think, you know, technology almost always goes ahead of our social or re regulatory frameworks, right? It's, it, that's not unusual. I just feel there's a pretty robust debate going on on this topic. In fact, we have colleagues, you know, in Geneva today uh, in, uh, at a conference called the AI for Good Summit, which is sponsored by the UN, and there's many world leaders there talking about this exact topic. And there's probably a conference like this every single month somewhere in the world. So I kind of feel like, you know, we're 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 dealing with it. But I don't want to say that there's no like scary scenarios because if I don't creep you out a little bit, then I probably didn't do my job. Uh, I mean, you know, so there 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 are some scenarios there, but I kind of feel like we're in control of that, and so I I, I don't doesn't keep me up at night. So so 
for AI to work well, it has to actually use a set of data. Um, because that's you know how the uh, the algorithms work, right? I mean, you have to start from something. Um, the amount of data that's personal, private data that's out there. So I'll, I'll you know I'll mention a quick example. I started life as as a transportation engineer, and one of the most expensive things for a transportation engineer was to collect traffic. I mean, used to be you know you had to stand at the corner of a street with a clicker and count how many cars. And I don't know if there are any engineers in, in this room. But if you do, uh, you'll sympathize standing on a corner in, in Chicago in, in the dead of winter and with a clicker in your hand and no gloves because it doesn't work with a glove. Now Google Maps has actually more data on traffic than any city in the world. Yeah. So coming back to you, Andrea, is there cause for concern? I mean, the, would I, with everything that we just Keith mentioned on AI and with this vast amount of data, should we be concerned at you know even the data that government has on on all of us, let alone you know what private companies have? I, I think we would be silly to say no. I think absolutely you should be concerned, and I think um, that concern is where it ought to start, right? M my data is my data, and I ought to be the first and foremost person concerned about how that data is being managed. Secondary to that is the fact that absolutely government has a responsibility when it comes to how they manage my data. Um, and I think you're seeing a big shift now, right? I think you're seeing a huge shift in terms of consumer rights as it relates to what happens with my data in government. You're seeing a trend in Europe that I think will shift over to the United States in terms of regulations being put around privacy and how data is managed by the government. Um, but I think there's some, some key activities that have to happen in government in order for, for us to say that, that we know what we're doing in, in security. Um, and I think, I think the state of California has started that. Um, they started doing assessments and audits of their security profiles, right? That something three years ago I can tell you wasn't happening. I can tell you two years ago it was very very rare that it was happening um, because I was sitting in the acting CISO position for the state of California and spending two to three days a week in the governor's office answering questions around you know security and, and why data in government wasn't more secure. Um, but the what the audits and the assessments enable us to do is be intentional about what we're doing to secure the data, right? It's forcing us to take a look at where do we spend money on security. To say that I increased my spending 25% in security means absolutely nothing unless I can point to what I'm doing that adds value to improving the security of the data that I'm responsible for. Um, it also takes you know, us taking a step back and looking at the data. We need to start to, to identify that data, what is that data telling us? What is whether or not that data really is a concern around PII, right? Um, how is the data accessed? Who can access that data? Uh, all of those types of questions, and there's a myriad of others, help us get to the point of saying what is the right kinds of technologies uh, as security from a security framework that we need to build into that. It tells us what are, how many layers of, of security do I need. You know, five years ago I sat at a conference and, and there were a few security vendors there and um, you know, talking to security vendors it was, you know, most people in government were saying, well, you know, I have this in my firewall, or I have this, or I'm doing, you know, single factor authentication, we're fine, right? Everybody was doing something, and then typically it was one thing. Um, the concept that wasn't out there was the idea that you had to do multi-layer security in order to ensure that your environment end-to-end -end was safe. So, so I started a dialogue with people around, you know, thinking about where you live, right? So if you think about your home, um, you know, chances are you have a security screen door and you probably have a, have, a, have a front door, right? And those both have deadlocks. And you likely have a security system and possibly even cameras on the front of your house. That right there is four layers of security just to get through your front door. And if they get into your front door, there's likely some level of security inside your house. A motion detectors, whatever, right? Maybe a dog, right? That's a layer of security. We think that's very normal, right? We, we don't even think twice about those types of things when we look at what do we do at home but when you bring it into the world of technology and you're talking to executives and you say, hey, I need five layers of security in order to feel comfortable about our environment, they look at you like you're crazy and they say, well, we just bought you know, X. Why is that not good enough? 
Um, and so I think that's the challenge that has historically been there. I think that challenge is slowly being broken down for government and I think it's being done um, finally now and I think you're going to start to see smart investment in security. Yeah. Um, because I don't think government, again, I don't think they have a choice. Yeah, let me let me add to that because that's those are those are really great points, and I, I I don't think you said the word, but pretty much everything you described could also be under that umbrella of governance, right? And 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 I think one of the the hard parts about AI in particular is that it, it really adds a le a level of complexity to this governance model that most organizations, public and private, are just not prepared for. So you you know talking about those five levels of security, so that you're mo mostly trying to keep things out essentially of your network, right? And and you know you know, actors from getting into your data and, and, and doing things with it. Well one of the challenges with AI is that once that data is in your model, okay, let's just assume it was good data, it was the right data. The problem is that the AI is very different than traditional software, right? Traditional software is written to execute commands. Now it could be ten billion lines of commands, but it just does what it's told to do. That's that's classic software. AI is very different. AI is is engineered to learn to do things, which means it's not just the, the data you start out with. It's it's literally this this the 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 learning process over time, and that process can be corrupted in different ways that are unrelated to the traditional risks that we talk about, and and it, it just falls outside the knowledge understanding of traditional sort of security and governance methods. So you might actually have put five labels of security and have great data and great data scientists, but over time your data has been corrupted for a variety of reasons. And, and that leads to a result that you don't want or that you don't even you know, realize. And so it, it just adds so much risk and complexity to a model which people are already struggling with. And now this takes it to a whole other level. So I think the world, again, both public and private sector is struggling with managing this, the new risks, new and expanded risks of, the, yeah. of these intelligence and, systems. And, and yeah. these are Good points, Keith. But uh, you know, you further highlighted something that Andrea was also mentioning. Uh, all of this new technology requires well-qualified people to do all of this work. Right? Uh, it doesn't. I mean, it does take some level of skill to be able to put in those levels of controls. That and I love the analogy, by the way, between the various levels of security and your own, you know, home security system, yeah. right? But still, it requires a lot of really sharp, skilled people in those areas. And I remember, in, you know, not that long ago, we, we actually sponsored a survey with LinkedIn looking at, you know, do young people, um, are they attracted? I mean, my generation, I think we all felt that there was a, um, a purpose in working for either for or in government. And the survey that we, we did just recently found that a lot of the young people are more excited about working with you know, private companies, with the Facebooks and Apples of this world instead of working with government. So that sense of purpose that at least my generation used to have seems to have you know, dithered uh, over time. How do you find these people in government? How do you actually describe, portray, convince them of the unique sense of purpose that you get from working in government and attract them to those jobs? Yeah, so I, I think that's a little bit of a tricky question because when you talk about technology across the board, um, I think it's a challenge and I don't know that it's a challenge government will ever overcome because I think there are some types of skill sets <coughs> that government is just not nimble enough to stay in, in front of. Um, and, and honestly, I think security is one of them. I think you can become a very good security uh, relationship manager, right, um, in terms of managing your, your relationships with your, part, your vendor partners. But um, I think there's a point where we as government need to say, what is the business we want to be in? And what do we want to focus our investments in, in terms of our people, and recruiting those skill sets. Now, at the same time, I think government has, has made some shifts in the last year that I, I I think are going to help to turn the tide in terms of who comes into government when it, we talk about technology across the board. Um, and that is, you know, revamping the, you know, four decade old job classifications, right? And using very modern language and enabling government and, and departments to focus recruitment on skill sets and classifications instead of these very generic types of classes. Um, you know, I think pay still has a long way to go with that in, in government if you, you know, really want to be super competitive, um, but I think it's okay to recognize that maybe government plays a role, and maybe that role is is bringing in and introducing those players to the, the market of government, so that as they become more proficient, and, and they do go to the private sector, because quite honestly, that's where the money is, they at least have the knowledge to come back and effectively serve government. Mm -hmm. um, 
so when you talk about things such as security, I, I mean, I, I honestly think that's where we're going to end up. Um, I don't think it's a whole lot different than kind of what we've done in the infrastructure arena with, you know, Verizon and AT&T and, and, and et cetera, right? We didn't build our infrastructure going across the state of California anymore, right? We jump on everybody else because it doesn't make sense to be in that business. Um, and and at the at the you know opposite end of that, you have skills such as project management, um, you know, business analysis, um, you know, becoming very proficient in the applications that you're running in your department that really run your department. Um, and I think those are some of the skills that we you know we need to be truly investing mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. um, security is is challenging, and and it's not just staying up with the technologies, but it's really staying in front of you know the hackers, right? It's staying in front of the people that want into your data, and I. I personally think that's a huge challenge in government, and I think it's not where we probably spend the best of our money. Yeah. So, again, coming back to a topic, and I think Keith, you also mentioned that, coming back to this topic of, you know, service levels and service qualities. So I think, you know, again, coming back to the title of this presentation of digital abundance, I think we've all now been somewhat spoiled with things like, for instance, online shopping, where you can get fairly instant gratification. Um, and, you know, I don't know about California, but a visit to the Virginia Department of Motor Vehicle, for me, is uh, equivalent to either going, you know, seeing my dentist or maybe mowing the grass. And I live on two acres, so it's a lot of work. Um, what have you seen? And I think you have a, a unique role at EY because, kind of, because you cross across various industries, yeah. you know. So you've worked in consumer, you've worked in, you know, various different sectors. But Can some of those learnings be transferred to government? Yeah, I mean, I, th I feel like we're in a kind of a renaissance of public s services in a sense, and at least I see that on a global scale. So uh, this didn't start with AI. I mean, this really goes back to sort of the digitization, you know, kind of work life kind of stuff, right? So I think, I think the. Um, what, the last 10 years or 15 years of increasing innovation and in how we shop and bank and all those things, you know, every, every sort of how, just every facet of our personal lives, you know, they did more than create commercial competition. What they did is they actually changed our mindset, the expectation that we have, regardless of the context, regardless of the service we're consuming, regardless of what we're doing. We just want things to feel kind of digital and convenient and personal and accessible. We certainly want to do it on our phone versus you know anything else and, and and it's just that has become a pervasive expectation in, in all parts of life and so I think the big surprise for a lot of companies who are not in the tech sector is that they find themselves competing with the user experience that Google and Facebook and other companies provide it's like wow I'm, I mean I, I you know I sell you know shoes d dance shoes I'm in the dance wear business why do I have to compete with Google well because no one makes the difference it's still on their computer screen or on their phones the same experience they don't really distinguish so so we've just found most companies have, have recognized that and I think governments have too and so you know as I travel the world and, and I, go, I was just in Estonia two weeks ago which is you know and I met with a good number of the ministers I mean, they, they're very advanced in their, and have been for a number of years in the use of digitalization to drive government services to make government services more accessible I think they mentioned they're the only country in the world now that is entirely in the cloud they essentially if, if, if Estonia got wiped off the map tomorrow which would be a horrible thing uh, <laughs> but because it's a very nice country but if it did they said they could run the entire country without the country like all the all the all the government data all the systems all the processes are stored in digital embassies around the world which they wouldn't reveal the locations in a way that they could continue to run the country without missing a beat like that's pretty cool you know and yeah. so that but that what what that is is that lays the foundation for this more sophisticated stuff right so to, to, to get back to your question you know whether it's Estonia uh, or, or the UAE uh, or Singapore or other countries you know you're seeing a lot of, of pressure to take you know to use AI as a a lever for innovation in public services, and 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 I do see that, and so you know we, we you know we're starting to see a lot of activity in chatbots and, and personal assistance through government agencies, including in the U.S. Where why wait on the call center? Why have to call and wait you know a half an hour if I could talk to a chatbot and get my the top 10 or 15 questions answered instantaneously, 24 yeah. hours a day? So you know you're starting to see more and more of that come, and, and I think that's really good for everybody. So so Estonia, and maybe I'll, I'll you know kind of play back this to to both Andrea and, and yourself. Estonia is. A, is a fantastic case study of the country coming out of communism and then just revamping uh, how they deal with their citizens through the use of IT. However, it's a small country yeah. and because they started from scratch, 
you know, so often when you start from scratch and you know you have absolutely, you, you know, no legacy and no baggage yeah, that you yeah, need yeah. to worry about, it sure. makes things easier. Yeah. Within our current context, Andrea, is is it possible to reinvent, revolutionize, or do you see this more as a gradual, gradual transition and evolution? Uh, you know, I think you're saying it. And I think you're seeing it as a gradual evolution. Um, you know, it's funny when you talk about artificial intelligence um, and its use in terms of government. It's it's one of the trends we're looking at in the judicial branch of government, right? Um, because we have a huge clientele that we serve in the in the courts, and um, you talk about a very complex process, right? If you're an individual trying to navigate the court process for something as simple as resolving a traffic ticket, right? Um, it's painful. It's yeah. painful. Yeah. It's almost as bad as going to DMV. Yeah. Um, but you know, and, and so to go out and look at their forms and and have a very unpersonal experience is challenging. And so where we're looking at is using artificial intelligence to say, you know, we we have to give our consumers that experience that they're getting everywhere else, right? Yeah. Government has to figure out how to compete in that world because that's the demand. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we're starting to pull in artificial intelligence to do things like bring the process to a very personal level to enable you to ask your own questions and get your own answers through chatbots and etc and not necessarily have to only deal with a series of prefabbed questions right um, to be able to have forms that are interactive and talk to you so mm -hmm. that as you're filling out forms it's guiding you through the process and it's and it's explaining to you why you're doing one form over another form and and how that form maybe plays out in the, in the big process mm -hmm. um, to talk about the different types of, of of court processes that you're going through and um, you know and then if you end up in the appeal court you know to be able to talk you through that process again because a completely different court process and so um, so I think you know if we use artificial intelligence in in a very positive light I think we gain huge benefits in government and being able to really personalize those experiences I think it also brings us the benefit of being able to do very in-depth predictive anal um, analysis right mm -hmm. doing things that that take you know lots of time today but to be able to look at information and say what would our recommended actions be based on previous outcomes right mm -hmm. things that have taken you know laborious time but in from a manpower perspective to be able to look at data in in one foul swoop and say you know where what should we be doing where should we be going how should decisions be being made um, I think that's huge just in government alone but but you know having said that and I do agree 100% with you but if I look at some of you know why you might get some pushback so some of you might be familiar with, you know, so Georgia Tech recently um, ran a robot as a teaching assistant, and they gave the teaching assistant an interesting name, John or Mandy or whatever. And um, students would actually send questions to that robot, which is a piece of software, and uh, the robot would actually answer and give direction on, you know, which question you should be looking at for your homework or which chapters you should study, etc. EY in the UK, because uh, we were getting a lot of resumes from folks, they decided to automate the whole HR department. So now if you're in, shouldn't be telling you this, but if you decide to send a resume to uh, EY in the United Kingdom, uh, your resume will be read by a robot. Uh, it'll figure out if you've missed, for instance, your graduation date or you didn't provide enough information of our previous employment. Then the robot will write you a nice email and it'll sign with a human person's name saying, you know you forgot this or that and please resubmit and then they'll kind of keep your record and that replaced I don't know how many people were doing this job but it's been far more effective yeah. for both the applicants as well as you know the EY internal folks whenever we have this discussion in and I'm not kind of you know pointing to anyone in particular but then there is always this little pushback what will happen to jobs, yeah. right? So let me ask you yeah. first, Keith, yeah. and I'll ask Andrea also to comment. Well, so th that example you gave about EY, and, and this is important because e EY uh, is a big consumer of this technology, not just a, not just a, a talker about it. We, we do a lot uh, for ourselves. In fact, we are uh, in the world, Fortune 1000 companies, we are number three in the adoption of robotics and automation within our own organization. So really quite a large, we're very serious about it. And, and but, but we, we do, uh, you have to make, this is 
it's a philosophical, if not values-based decision, right? Because you, you're going to automate tasks, not jobs, that you automate individual tasks, but tasks add up to impact jobs. Just, to, you know, that's how the formula works, right? Because, I mean, any given job, even what might seem like a simple job, might have 500 tasks, you know, if you really break it down. But, but some jobs are more automatable than others, you know? And, and, and this includes white-collar and blue-collar jobs. This is not just a back office thing. This includes many well-paying, highly educated jobs, you, you, surprisingly. Uh, and frankly, accounting and tax has a lot of manual repetitive work in, in, in a lot of the aspects of the, those jobs. So actually, a lot of the things that are the typical EY practitioner does can be automated you know, through these sophisticated tools. So you have to make a choice as a company. And I have this conversation with CEOs all the time. You have to make a choice. Where do you stand on this question? Do you want to automate people out of work? Or do you want to amplify human performance? Do you want to use these tools to enable people to have a more meaningful work, to, to expand services to your customers, to improve the nature of what you do, or you just want to cut costs? And, 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 and very, very few companies fall into that latter category. Most want to improve work experience for their employees. Most want to help them improve their productivity. Most want to free them up from, from menial tasks. So, so I think that what's happening is uh, th there is, you know, there are clearly some jobs that are affected more than others, but net-net, I find very few CEOs want to, and including EY, we've made a very specific decision not to. So we have shaved tens of millions of hours, you know, and automated, you know, lots of repetitive manual work, but we haven't reduced our headcount because we're growing. We're a high-growth organization. Now, we may hire Hire less people in certain departments as going forward, but we're not reducing headcount as a result of automation. That's a choice we made, right? And I think that's that, that's where a lot of companies are affected. Although I, I will give Jack Ma, uh, the CEO of um, Alibaba, some credit. You know, he. Back at the World Economic Forum in January, you know, all the CEOs of the big tech companies were interviewed on this question, you know, and, and mm -hmm. they all pretty much read from the same script, you know, to be honest. They all kind of said the same thing. Uh, only Jack Ma, as the CEO of Alibaba, came out and said, yeah, yeah, that's all very nice. We, millions of people are going to be affected if we don't change the way people are trained and educated. And he's right, because I have three teenagers in the school system t right now, and, and I am not thrilled with the nature of the education they're getting, because it's not preparing them for a very automated world in which memorizing things and, and low critical skill jobs are just going to be less desirable. They're going to be, you know, you're going to need different skills to, to be successful, and I don't feel like we're training them for that. Mm -hmm. And that's where, so Jack was right, he says, we do need to, so to me, the conversation is less about the removal of jobs as it is the need to embrace more continuous learning and changing the way we educate people. And that's and that, I think we just got to shift the conversation to so, that. So let me ask you the same exact question, uh, Andrea. You know, the knee-jerk reaction of you doing away with thousands of jobs if you did this. How would one get around this within within the government? Go, given that you know, knowing that you have more constraints that, than you would in the private sector. Sure. Um, I, I, you know, I think if I could say that we sit in a world where government is ahead of the game in terms of delivering service, that would be a far different conversation to have. Um, reality is I don't know of any state department out there, I don't know of really any government entity that would say we have far more people than we have work to do. Yeah, right? That's right. Typically the issue is, and, and you know, because of years and years of reductions in the past, you have departments who have lived on the dime of do more with less, do more with less, right? And, and automation is just now starting to make that even maybe somewhat possible. We're just starting to hit the tip of that iceberg of saying, okay, I, I think I actually see air above me. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, you know and, and I can tell you especially within the courts, right, artificial intelligence is really adding a layer of service that we're not able to provide effectively today. It's not taking something away from what somebody is doing today, it's adding a layer of, of what we can't deliver. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really improving the service. Um, now is that across the board, you know, five, ten years from now as we see more and more automation, more and more use of different types of artificial intelligence? You know, I, I mean, I think that's a different discussion that has to be had. I know a lot of the analysis that I have done, because um, I am one of those weird geeky people that still does go out there and do analysis of, of what's trending in, in um, government and in technology, um, you know, positions such as accountants and attorneys are, are going to be less in demand, which to me says 
as was pointed out by Keith, when do we start the dialogue around what do we start focusing our education in, right? Um, you know, I have three daughters, I have two that are in college, and I can tell you when they both talk to me about, you know, what are the kinds of things they ought to be looking at. Thankfully, they're both interested in the medical field because that will be in demand. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I, I absolutely steered them away from positions such as attorneys, right? I steered them away from things where I saw data so readily available that with good data analytics, that job would be, would be irrelevant, Absolutely. right? Um, my 10-year-old, um, you know, she's one I guide, and I'm like, you know, sweetie, take a look at STEM, right? Science, technology, engineering, math, man, this stuff's exciting. Um, she says, I want to be a vet because I like animals. <laughs> But, but bottom line is, right, we've got to, we've got to loop in education. And I think yeah. we've got to loop education in at the, at the earliest level to say, what is it that we should be teaching? How is it that we should be teaching this information? What are the tools we ought to be exposing them to? And how early should they have those so that they can become prepared to, to survive in this world? My 10-year-old is much more advanced than I am on any piece of, of electronics equipment. I hand her a phone, and, and she does far more things with it than I can even imagine doing. And, and will say things to me, and I'm like, I don't even know what you just said. I don't even know what that is that you just did, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and I think that's the reality. And if we keep accentuating that and we keep encouraging that, then I think we drive ourselves to a position where our kids are employable. Yeah, and, and you saw everyone saw the movie Hidden Figures, yeah. right? You know, I mean that that I mean most people who watched that movie obviously were you know were mostly what resonated with, with, the, with the with the social themes and and the African American women, you know, you know obviously fighting for equal justice and and, and and uh, you know that that whole conversation, but the, the secondary theme was that amazing story, true story, you know, of, of the you know of the manager of that computer department who saw the IBM mainframe coming and got ahead of that, you know, and, and studied cobalt at night and retrained the women on her team to be programmers, right? And and that story is really what this is about, right? I mean, it's it's about that that the ability to see that trend. Now, not everyone is going to pick up on that. Not everyone's going to have the benefit of a visionary manager who will help them, you know, reposition, right? That is the reality. But that is, it was true in the 1950s and it's true today, right? That, that really hasn't changed. Yeah. So, so let me ask you, and, and you know, I'll ask you that question, and I, I actually have a ton more because, I mean, it, this is fun, right? So, um, but I'll, I'd love to also, in case someone from the crowd, from the audience, would like to ask you any questions. So, if you were to close your eyes and, you know, kind of project, you know, five, ten years into the future, what would be in your mind, and we talked about all sorts of, you know, we talked about robotics and automation and AI, what would be the one thing that you feel will dramatically impact how citizens relate to government or how government operates or, you know, some, some kind of, you know, major shift sure. in, in the current landscape? What would you, what would you think that could be? Um, it's what I call one face, one government, one stop shop. Right, um, and and I don't mean just for state government or for city or for for any other local or federal. I mean for government. Um, I am in so many different systems because I live in a city, I live in a county, I live in a state, and I live in a nation. Right, and why all of those entities cannot be cross connected just baffles me. And I know it can be done, but I think when you talk about five years from now, I think where the emphasis is going to be is getting to there, getting to a mechanism where I, as a consumer, um, can get access to government, any government, anywhere, anytime, any place, any way I want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Yeah. Actually, I have a lot of questions on. Yeah, <laughs> but anyway, we'll stop there. Keith. Well, I would just tie together some things we talked about earlier. You mentioned predictive, you know, analytics, and I, I think that that's we haven't even scratched the surface of that. And and so, you know, if you if you look at uh, Amazon and Netflix, you know, very successful uh, companies, at the heart of their innovation, you know, is, is this ability to, to recommend things, this recommendation engine, essentially, that, that drives content or offers or products sort of to your way. And, and it really makes a great experience. And Netflix has come out and said very clearly that when they've sort of tweaked their recommendation engine, they can see their loyalty drop. And if they tweak it a little, they can see the loyalty go straight up. Like, really direct relationship between their ability to create that personalized experience and your enjoyment of that experience. And I think none of that is, that's typically not a part of the government public sector experience. And I, I think, so I think we'll use predictive analytics and all this data, you know, in a lot of different ways, but one of the ways will be to anticipate citizen needs and not just react to them and, and, and anticipate, you know, how best
has to deploy assets, anticipate how to do certain things, and that's just going to be a, a fundamental change in the, the way in which government serves citizens. So I think that's li that's likely to come. Yeah. So like you, I have three daughters, um, and one of them just graduated last week from college. So I'm I feel I'm feeling a bit richer today than I was last week. <laughs> Um, but one of the projects that she worked on, which I thought, you know, coming back to STEM and, and where the world is going, uh, she worked on how can you do drone deliveries for Amazon. So it was a project commissioned by Amazon to do uh, drone, which I thought was, was actually quite exciting. Let me open it. We have a couple of minutes. We don't have a lot of time. So any questions from the crowd? Because as, as you can see, I can keep on going for, you know, a couple of hours more. But any questions from the crowd? Anything that you'd like to ask either Andrea or, or Keith? So, when you were talking about um, uh, uh, having uh, more predictive um, uh, forms, like, you know, more intelligent forms, mm -hmm. were you referring to like TurboTax? You know, I mean, kind of the same. Like, I, I was saying, oh, that sounds a lot like. It does your taxes for you, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's absolutely what we're looking at in the courts is having that kind of an experience when you go into the court process. And and part of it is, you know, we have a lot of people that we call self litigants, right? They self represent. They do their own documentation. Um, and and you know, I can tell you myself, I had to use the courts to deal with some stuff a few years ago. I, you know, I have a master's degree. I'm an executive in government. I was surprised how challenging it was to figure out how to navigate the process and and how to get one thing accomplished. I mean, it was so frustrating that I just decided, forget it, I'm not going to do it. Right? <laughs> uh, where do you go for your resources to develop the systems? The data scientists, the, the, analyst, the business analysts, the people that uh, understand how to burrow into the information to find what's valuable. Uh, you know, I, typically myself, it's been uh, uh, government vendor partnerships, um, and and I think that's where we continue to go. Right? We bring in good solutions. We bring in good people that know how to help implement those solutions, and we learn how to sustain them in terms of, of getting the data where it needs to be and and being able to get the the information out of it. Um, but it's it's what I've been doing for a long time, in in technology. There was a question over here. Any? Yeah. Yes, please. Um, you know, I, I think you're going to see something come out in the area of regulating data, data use, and, and um, some, some language around privacy, um, absolutely. Yeah. I don't know that I'll, you'll see it to the extent that we have, you know, exactly. And I don't think you'll see that it, it's, it, it's an expenditure, right, that it's a chargeback. In other words, that, you know, I'm holding your data for you, therefore pay me for my service, right? I don't think you'll see it in that realm. But I do think you'll see it from a regulated perspective. I, I don't know that we have so, a lot of choices So it's, in that. it's interesting that you're mentioning this. So the European Union yeah. came up with March the 20. General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. Um, so what was amazing about that regulation because, and if you've, you know, for those who've been watching the, um, uh, the recent, uh, you know, various kind of presentations that were made to Congress, including the, the Facebook Zuckerberg's presentation about data. So there's always been this question, can you regulate data over the internet because it's so decentralized. Uh, when the European Union, and by the way, the EU is not well known for coming up with good regulations, but I would take exception to that particular one, uh, because that actually um, holds, holds the promise of protecting the data of EU citizens. You'll find it actually surprising in our work with various universities here in the US, because they get European students 
they too have to comply with that same data protection regulation, even though, as U.S. institutions, they do not abide by EU regulations. But nonetheless, because they have EU students, they have a duty to protect their data. So we're finding some of them beginning to adopt that same regulation, even though that was done outside the, you know, the normal legal jurisdiction. So I know we're running out of time. I do thank you for your attention. It's been my pleasure uh, to speak with you today, also to have Andrea and Keith on, on the panel. And I wish you a pleasant day and a fantastic week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.